The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Power and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. And I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. And tonight we're asking you... What are you afraid of? Haunted Beaches and Battlefields. This is T. Fox Dunham. And this is Phil Thomas. Happy summer, and Phil. <laughs> yeah, happy summer, Fox. God. Uh, almost, happy almost summer. Yeah. We got the Memorial Day weekend coming up this weekend. We do. And, yeah, it's, it, you know, we're, we're back. Um, that, it's a new meaning to the word we're back, because I don't think we've... <laughs> I don't think we've done a show in, it's been quite a while. Yeah, I had to take another hiatus. Um, I got pretty yeah. sick and just trying to pull things back together, and the world is kind of thawing out, at least in America. Um, Literally and figuratively, the weather's warm, and COVID, uh, we seem to be, you know, turning the restrictions corner. are starting to lift. Mm-hmm. We're starting to get back to some kind of normalcy. I remember one year ago, we were doing an episode with Greg Bear. Right. And those are great episodes. I love talking to Greg Bear. And was. I was just fooling myself. I had predicted that within like four or five weeks, the numbers will go down and we will be able to have a summer. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, you know, I remember that. Yeah. He, he said, you know, it's going to, this will, this will taper off. No, I mean, yeah. I, to be honest, I did not share that mindset. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I did not see it happening. Yeah. Um, I kind of accepted the fact that last summer was just shot. And yeah. <laughs> um, as much as I didn't want it to be, I just, I kind of, I kind of accepted it. You know, Eventually I got I there. Yeah. 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 I think I, um, um, I started to DMV And a lot of group. people didn't want it. A lot of people did not want to, you know, just didn't want to face that reality that, yeah, it's just, it's just shot. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was gone. But, but like I said, yeah. I, I started a D and D group online mm-hmm. with old friends. Mm-hmm. And so, that was sort of how I got through my summer, but it, we're back on episode 156. This is What Are You Afraid of? Our Paranormal Show on Parax Radio, Friday nights at 9 p.m. Check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And I mean, it was like, Allison and I were like, oh, we'll wait to go to the shore. We'll wait until like September. I know it's been almost two years now. There's going to be a lot of people there. And then I just was looking on booking.com last week, and I saw a hotel room. In Ocean City, New Jersey, right off the boardwalk, right in the middle there, for like 90 bucks, and I just grabbed it. <laughs> yeah. So we spent Friday through Saturday in Ocean City, and it was the summer. It was just like it's always been. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know Ocean City's yeah. had a lot of trouble uh, financially, but they've survived, and the prices are up a little bit, but I don't mind paying it because I know they suffered last summer. Yeah, yeah, they really did. They, they're, they're basically trying to compensate. Yeah, for their losses. Exactly. So I, mean, I, that. I spent five dollars on a regular soft serve cone at cone at court. Wow. Yeah, five dollars wow. for that. And wow, um, I got three pieces <laughs> of pizza for me and Alice, and that was eighteen. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So where where did you where did you get the pizza from? 
Oh, it's like Italiano Festival. Um, it's not oh. Manco's. Okay, yeah. Fanconi's is pretty good. Fanconi's yeah, is. is pretty good. Um, but just, you know, I just went over to the one place I knew, so. But it was fun. We had mm-hmm. a good time. And I had time, while Allison was napping Friday, to go over to a place that I've never visited, but I've told a lot of ghost stories about, the Flanders Hotel. Mm, okay. I'm sure you've seen it. Beautiful. I have grand 1920s hotel uh still in the heart of ocean city very expensive but Mm. beautiful i've never been in there so allison was napping Mm -hmm. and we were at the um ocean manor inn which is right across the street from the flanders Mm -hmm. so i went over while she was napping and it's just so gorgeous inside it's like going back to the time of Jay Gatsby and the Great Gatsby in the 1920s. Nice. <laughs> and nice. It was built in 1923, named okay. after Flanders Field in Belgium, um, for the poem where American soldiers who served and died during World War I are buried. And it was built to be this grand, opulent hotel in a burgeoning and starting uh, community of tourists who were going to the ocean in new jersey back when places like ocean city were just getting started right and the amazing thing was in 1927 there was a huge fire in ocean city Mm -hmm. that wiped out 12 blocks including the boardwalk yet wow for some reason the flanders hotel wasn't touched wow yeah well that's good it burned all around the building it burned the boardwalk out but the mm. hotel was fine. Nice. Well, yeah. that's good. That's a very good thing. Right. It so is. they built the they built the boardwalk closer to the ocean. And it, it was funny when I walked in and I was looking for the portrait of Emily that was done by Tony Troy in 1999 mm-hmm. based on uh, the observations of the guests who had seen the ghost of Emily. And I walked in there, you know, some places don't want to talk about their paranormal history, but this yeah. place, it was everywhere. It was like, really? go to Emily's guest house, head up yeah. to Emily's mirror room, Emily this, Emily that, you know, she was, they, they're really promoting wow. her, yeah. Wow. But, <laughs> but it's gorgeous down there. They have all these old wedding dresses. Mm-hmm. They have pianos, they have paintings all over the walls. Going into the Flanders Hotel was a lot like the book Somewhere in Time by Richard Matheson. You know the book, mm-hmm. right? I do, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you seen the movie with Christopher Reeve? I have. I have seen it. One of the uh, most magical times. films that I remember seeing. Just he, um, he believes he can travel in time by, mm-hmm. by creating the mentality of being in the 1920s after he falls in love with a woman um, who had a portrait up on the wall. And I felt a lot like that going into the Flanders. And I wanted to see where the portrait was of Emily. And I couldn't mm-hmm. find it on the first floor, so I asked, thinking they're going to throw me out. And they're like, oh no, it's on the second floor. So I went up mm. the stairs, and on the second floor is another beautiful gallery of mm-hmm. old couches, this incredible marble fireplace. And then you see it, this gorgeous painting of a woman with red hair standing mm-hmm. at, the, at the piano. and. Emily, I, she's a happy spirit. You, they've seen nice. her walking through walls. She jiggles doorknobs. She shows <laughs> up in wedding photos. She likes oh, to unscrew cool. light bulbs. And you can even hear her singing. And some guests have actually seen her a white dress trailing around the corners of the yeah. halls and things like that. And wow. I swear when I was upstairs in that empty ward, um, like over by the elevators, I swear I could just hear a woman laughing in the distance. And I went around the corner to the entrance to the mirror room where I thought there were people talking and the place was completely empty. Were you creeped out at all by that? I was charmed, honestly. Charmed, yeah. yeah. Like, often you get creeped out by it, but they're right. If it is a spirit and her name is Emily, she's mischievous and fun and full of light and loves the hotel. Right, right. (laughs) That's great. That's great. (laughs) It was a fun experience, yeah. and I'll put up those photos. I took several photos. I'll put them up at our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com 
where you can find the original ghost story, The Ghost of Emily, about the Flanders Hotel. So that was a great trip. Nice. Yeah, it definitely sounds like you had a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, like every... I, I, one of those, I've never actually been into that, into that motel before. Yeah. I was never actually in there. Uh, but I, I'm very aware of it. I've seen it from the outside. Oh, yes. I, I will have to go, I'll have to go in sometime and check it out. Now that I know what you uh, just explained about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to, next time in Ocean City, I'm going to go, I'm going to go in. You can walk around and they have shop. They have like mm-hmm. several shops on the ground floor. And yeah, they're, they're used to people coming in. The place is just a beautiful passage in time. You know, oh. it takes you back. But, I love that. I love that. You know, and you know what? Now I'm going to have to go back and watch that Christopher Reeve movie now. Oh. You have to show it to Allison, actually. I think she... I haven't seen it in a very long time. Yeah, it's just such a magical film, and it makes you feel I remember like a kid really again. liking it. I mean, I remember... I have a memory of watching it. I've mm-hmm. only seen it, like, once or twice, but I remember watching it probably about 10, 15 years ago, and I, I recall, like, having a very, you know, like, uh, enjoyable experience with it. Mm-hmm. And one of, I, I really, one of Christopher Reeve's last movies, um, yeah, yeah. Um, before he had the accident. Yeah, it was like, right, right, what was it, 90? What year was that, 80? Yeah. I no, wait, what year was that, 80? It was late well, 80s. No, his, yeah. I'm not sure the exact year, but I, he had his accident, what, 95, right? I think so, yeah. He was 95. And he fell off the horse, and that was, yeah, very tragic. And um, he had just done that movie, the remake with the kids with white hair and the. Yeah. Oh, um, the John Carpenter, was it the John Carpenter yeah. movie? Yes, I yeah. think so. Um, yeah, Children of the Damned, I think it was. Yeah, and Am uh, I right on that? Mark Hamill was in it. <laughs> That's the yeah, I, yeah, I haven't seen that in a very long time. I'm a huge John Carpenter fan, but I have not seen that movie in a very long time. John Carpenter's stuff in the, uh, well, at least my opinion, is in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Were a little, yeah, they, they lost a little bit of something since his, from his 80s movies. Yeah, definitely. They were, they were trying to. The movies were so original in the 80s, and then they really started getting marketed. And Yeah. I wish he would go back to it, though. I don't think, I don't think he has any interest in directing anymore, but I would like to see him go back. The last thing he did was over, uh, The Ward over 10 mm-hmm. years ago, and I actually own it because uh, it's John Carpenter. Right. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> so, the, the you know. only way you're going to get original horror fiction that takes chances it's going to be through an indie production. Right. They just, everything's so marketed out of Hollywood, and I, I'll enjoy uh, movies on indie horror again, and, and definitely seek them out because they need support. Same with indie writers. But, uh, but this is episode 156, Haunted Beaches and Battlefields, and we are going to pause for a ghost story. And I wrote up this ghost story, and it's set in Gettysburg, another favorite destination of ours in the summer. Oh, yeah. And this is at the Belladere Inn. It's called Gentlemen Ghosts Prefer Blondes at the mm-hmm. Belladere Inn, which is kind of a, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll find out about a bit of a, a trickster ghost there who likes to flirt with women. But this is, yeah. it, and it isn't me, I promise. Oh, okay. <laughs> but this nice. is episode 156, Haunted Beaches and Battlefields. And this is our ghost story, narrated by David Walton. We'll be right back. This is Katrina Weidman of Destination America. This is Joe R. Lansdale, creator of the Happen Leonard series. This is actor and filmmaker Steve Monarch from Friday the 13th, the series. This is Heather Taddy from Paranormal State and Alien Highway. This is Chuck Zukowski from Travel Channel's show Alien Highway. This is Dacre Stoker, great-grand-nephew of Bram Stoker and author of Dracul. This is Michelle Belanger from Portals to Hell. And you are listening to Ghost Stories and Horror with T. Fox Dunham and Phil Thomas. With the T. Fox Dunham and, and Phil Thomas. Fox and Phil. Billy and Fox. What are you afraid of? 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 Horror and paranormal show. What are you afraid of? <laughs> There'd be no Philadelphia without Uncle Lloyd. Gentlemen ghosts prefer blondes. The spirits of the Balladary Inn, Gettysburg. Written and researched by T. Fox Dunham. Read by David Walton. The Balladary Inn was originally built in 1812 on the site of the George Bushman farm and in 1992 the house was expanded by owners Judy and Kenny Cordill into a bed and breakfast. Ten decorated rooms make up the main and carriage house 
and the great room is built around the original brick fireplace and beamed ceilings. It opens onto a terrace that has a beautiful view of the verdant green fields and hills of Gettysburg. During the Battle of Gettysburg, historians believe the Bushman farm was used as a field hospital. Many buildings adjacent to the battlefield were turned into field hospitals to treat the large amounts of soldiers wounded during the three days of a battle that took place at the start of July. Though not officially listed as a field hospital, the Balladary Inn is near Hospital Road, which is dotted with the US government field hospital markers for different army corps. Such hospitals were often the sites of emergency amputations and where many soldiers died from their injuries. Such suffering and deaths are often blamed as the reason for active hauntings, especially when the bodies remain buried on site. After the battle, Union soldiers were buried in consecrated cemeteries. However, until the 1870s, it was considered disrespectful to bury Confederate soldiers with the Union fallen. Confederate soldiers were often left where they had fallen on the battlefield and their bodies were covered with tattered blankets and a layer of dirt. Over the decades, the city moved on from the battle and expanded. However, this also meant that new homes and businesses were often built on top of unofficial burial grounds. And as we know from ghost stories, this disturbs the dead. When the Balladary expanded, it inadvertently did so over the graves of Confederate soldiers. It is believed several Confederate soldiers are buried beneath the tennis courts. Guests often request rooms in the new wing, believing the new areas won't be haunted. They are often surprised. Witnesses have identified a few different spirits haunting the inn. Guests have inadvertently photographed several Confederate soldiers in uniform. In the photo, two of the ghosts sit near French-style double doors and two stand just outside. One of the soldiers wears a black armband, probably to mourn the death of General Stonewall Jackson. Some guests have seen soldiers in uniform marching in the nearby woods in the middle of the night. The ghosts of nurses and children have been spotted in the corridors. Spirits also appear and disappear around the gazebo, and the phantom cries of the wounded can sometimes be heard along with marching music or the pounding of horse hooves against the ground. Gettysburg historian, author and paranormal investigator Mark Nesbitt was invited by the inn's owner to investigate the inn. Mark is a friend of the show and we've done several episodes with him. We call him Mr. Ghosts of Gettysburg. He and his wife host ghost tours in Gettysburg. Find out more at his website ghostsofgettysburg.com Before their investigation began the owner made an odd suggestion to Mark bring a couple of blondes. He was told by the owner that the presence of blonde-haired ladies excites one of the spirits. This spirit has come to be called Loverboy or Geoffrey. This creepy spirit can often be sensed in the primrose room. Female guests report that they have felt phantom hands rubbing their feet while a male voice sings in their ears. Even worse, some complain of an invisible entity climbing into their beds. Mark brought three valued paranormal investigators who also happened to be fair-haired. His wife, Carol, Catherine Ramsland, co-author of his book Blood and Ghosts and Haunted Crime Scenes, and Julie, a spiritual liaison or medium. During the night, 
Julie perceived several spirits, including one that was drawing energy from Mark, which left him exhausted after the investigation. Mark spent part of the evening attempting to document evidence by taking photographs and recording EVPs, electronic voice phenomena. To get a good EVP, Mark attempted to invoke the spirit with questions to which the ghost might respond. The following section is from Mark Nesbitt's book, Ghosts of Gettysburg 8, Spirits, Apparitions and Haunted Places on the Battlefield, and has been used with the permission of the author. I had been trying to get some EVPs, addressing one of the former owners of the house. I knew he enjoyed his bourbon, and I told him I was drinking bourbon at his house, just like the old days. Do they have bourbon in heaven? And I got a rousing loud noise, seemingly confirmation that one of my favourite pastimes may still be available in the afterlife. A paranormal investigation can be a little frustrating because much of the data that is captured isn't discovered or recognised until you put it on a computer screen to enlarge it, as in photos, or run it through a computer audio programme using earphones for captured EVP. So I was resigned to the fact that it would probably be a pretty uneventful evening until I got back to my computer. I was wrong. I had finished taking photos and was sitting recording and watching what was going on. Julie was facing a wall with a closet in it and Carol and Catherine were behind her, sitting on one of the twin beds, observing. Suddenly I heard Julie exclaim, No, he's too far to the left, too far to the left and raised her arms as if fending off something I couldn't see. She continued to mumble something incoherent, seemed to become unconscious of her surroundings, and began to fall. Julie was, by far, the tallest and largest of the three women in the room. She's a good four or five inches taller than Carol, and much larger than diminutive Catherine. As I saw her start to stagger backward, I started to rise to catch her, but I was all the way across the room. There was no way I'd reach her in time. As I watched, Carol and Catherine stood up to try and catch Julie, but instead of falling backward and taking the two women with her to the floor, her body did the unbelievable. She floated. Her body levitated gently back into Carol's and Catherine's hands, and the two women, using less energy than if they were carrying a blanket, moved Julie the few feet until she was over the bed, then laid her down on it. That said, it gets even stranger. I was reviewing the audio from the session after downloading it to my computer. There was one recording that caught my attention. What I heard recorded in the room that night, while Julie was having a problem with an entity, was not like anything I've heard before or since. It was a low-pitched, sing-songy, baritone voice, seemingly mocking, in an almost childlike tune. Whatever was happening in the room that night, I can't say for sure but we had evidently been visited by something not benevolent or understanding. I can't say any more about it than that, since I'm not versed in anything besides friendly, or at least neutral spirits. The voice or noise I heard was menacing. I hope to never hear anything like it again. For more information about the Belladere Inn, Mark Nesbitt, Candlelight Walking Tours of Gettysburg and his books, you can find links on our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com Rat! Rat! Where are you going?
I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett, Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett! 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 Rhett, if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear... Line! Oh, you, you gotta be kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. What are you afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show is an eclectic audio magazine created by the authors T. Fox Dunham and Bill Thomas that explores everything dark, strange, paranormal, and creative through ghost stories, fiction, conversation, music, humor, and interviews with authors, filmmakers, crafters, historians, and paranormal investigators. We also create a series of author events. We are both published authors interested in a variety of topics exploring the darkness through produced segments of the subject of horror, the paranormal, the art of writing and noir, anything dark. Topics better enjoyed at night. We do the show to promote our published work and we support other artists and authors with the show. We entertain to reach out to new readers. Fox and I record this show in the city of Philadelphia and we are often on location in haunted sites and artist events. Listen to over 120 episodes on Para-X Radio on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also find the show on most major podcast services including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and many more. Or you can check out our expanded content, Ghost Story Archives, links, interviews, and articles on our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. Email your true paranormal experiences to whatareyouafraidof117 at gmail.com to be produced into narrated segments by our voice actors, or contact us through the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com where you can find guidelines about our ghost story submissions. We don't judge. Our mission is to tell a good story. What are you afraid of for a paranormal show? Because it's more fun to play in the dark. Your source for everything paranormal, Para X. Yo, see when we started, we had no idea about being artists. Wanted to spit 64 bars over guitarists, that hard shit. The six minute tracks are hard to market, but I say real music heads ain't hard to target, so blast it. Especially if you ain't feeling the garbage I'm heartless when I hear the beat so heartless You went studio, we did this shit in Blas Crib with Lars, lit in beer bottles all over the carpet We mix a million genres, if anyone asks this guitar pit Homegrown, you better spark it on a mission to bring them all out With the spirit of Jim Morrison To kick your doors down, raw sound Come into a venue in your town And we shoot so many bars We need some more rounds So it's more rounds But applause, we don't do this for The cause is the force For these weed smoking troubadours You record Inside the parameters The world is our oyster We skip by any barriers Hard you know we armed with a fusion of all these hearts We're pursuing our only paths and our youth is our only chance We don't grow up believing there's no love So I'm stuck till my soul's up believing Shout out to Clash the Cough for no fucking reason We that all singing, all dancing in your face No pardons, listen mate, some new shit Come to expand rapping This is live music, jump on the bandwagon Let's go Left the right is the question now Cause we're figuring our direction now
nah, cause the game don't sound fair Round here, motherfuckers try and take your soul When the shit goes down, kid, you better know your role I remember when I had myself a studio at 18 40 man rushed me trying to take my keys Shout out to Styler for the other time He backed the beef, do something positive And lose to the deceitful streets What a shame, but it's all good See me in my race Filling my days in the most insidious ways I boss a brilliant brain Just made for killing this game We're not losing this booth for my feelings the same Like oh, which way to go Like a game of Monopoly Real estate of mine But the fakes are hot Property, the devil's caught Blocking me, I'm stuck on Highway 61 You tell my mom the only room for me Is the risky one, one. Left or right is the question now As we're figuring our direction now Dust at the Heel of Par by Kings of the City, used with a music sharing 3.0 license. Episode 156, Haunted Beaches and Battlefields, talking about some of our favorite places to visit in the summer. Are you going to head up to Gettysburg? Yeah, I, I definitely plan on getting there this summer. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, It's been, oh gosh, gosh, I can't even, I don't even remember when it, it I think when we were together. That was the last time I was there. I think so. Yeah. And that was, what, 2000? It was two, three years ago, yeah. God, we've been... 17. 2017. Yeah. My word. September. September of 17. Wow, that's that, that long ago. All right, that, that's when I lived in Lansdale. And living in Lancaster, it's now only about 45 minutes away. Oh, yeah, you're really close. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. We are. Yeah, yeah, you're close. I'm jealous. That's all right. <laughs> well, we're we're looking forward to getting into Maryland a lot this but year. You, but you, but you, uh, how, so how long was your your ride to Ocean City? Oh, that was <laughs> well. Um, to be fair, we had to stop at Allison's parent house, parents' house to okay. switch cars. Uh, her car needed some repair work, and her dad took it to the dealer. So mm. let's see. Going to her parents' house was an hour and a half. And okay. then getting for to Ocean City from there was about two hours. Yeah, so you're looking at three and a half hours. But coming home directly was only about two hours and ten minutes. Oh, that's it? Yeah, that's it. But, um, wow. Yeah, uh, there's a direct... 76 has a direct route that bypasses that goes right to King of Prussia and then takes mm. you right over to Lancaster. So it wasn't that bad. That's good. Yeah, the ride home, which is when we were really tired and I'm sunburned sure. and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Did you get on the beach? Uh, we never got to the beach. It was, just, okay. it was crowded. I think the entire East Coast chose that weekend <laughs> to go to. Um, it, it was definitely a feeling of it's all over. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. We, went, we went Friday through Saturday and left Saturday night. And as we were riding home, you know, you go over the causeway. Mm-hmm. to get to the mainland, and there was a, a line of traffic right to the stoplight that ended halfway across the causeway. Wow. And then we went up 7 to the Atlantic City Expressway, and yet again on the opposite lane of traffic, uh, right from the turn all the way to the first shore, first shore points, a complete wall of traffic. Yeah. Everybody's going. Everybody's going, yeah. Wow, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> 
Glad I <laughs> yeah. didn't get out of that point. Yeah. So goodness, we we are going to the Hudson Valley in mm-hmm. two weeks. Nice. Two or three weeks, yeah. Um, up to Cold Spring, which should be very nice. Cold Spring, yeah. 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 Love Cold Spring. That's a great place. Right. We stayed at a place in Ocean City called Ocean Manor, and it's old. I mean, they're all old. They're going right. to do. Beautiful, but old. And there were Bibles everywhere. Like, mm-hmm. the woman who ran the place had, like, three Bibles open on the coffee table. There was a Bible on the counter when you sign in. There were two or three Bibles all in the room. And mm-hmm. there were Bible verses up on all the walls. Okay. And oh, it was wow. a little mm. bit a little bit oppressive yeah. after a little while. And I was coming down the hallway. Allison was sleeping. It was when I got back from the Flanders Hotel. You mm-hmm. go up in this little elevator and I, you head down the hallway, this, these tight little hallways, and I swear I heard someone walking behind me mm. and I saw a shadow on the wall and I turned around and again, I was the only one on that floor. Well, oh, creepy. <laughs> so you have to wonder, you know, yeah. what were all the Bibles for? Was huh. some, did something scare her mm. there? Was there? Yeah, was there something? I guess you never asked her, right? Of course not, no. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like to talk <laughs> about that, but... Yeah. Ocean yeah, City wow. is just a really haunted place. It is. It is. It's, it, it's, a, it's a very haunted place, and so is Cape May. Yes. Cape right. May, Cape May ghost stories are, are wonderful. <laughs> I love <laughs> we, We've even done a few. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another... There's something about Cape May. It just seems to be really, really haunted. Not like not like Gettysburg haunted. That's that's even right. <laughs> that's another level. But right. yeah, uh, I mean Gettysburg is just. Ooh. Um, if you die, do you mm. want to hang out in the house where you live, or do you want to go spend your afterlife at the beach? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, I back and forth, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna commute. Yeah. Not really anything <laughs> different from life then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, I don't think you even need to commute. It would just pop back and forth. What, practically instantaneous. Yeah. I, I hope think. so. That would be nice. Yeah. Create a test yeah. rack, bend space and time. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of snap your ghostly fingers and end up wherever you want. I hope so. That would be pleasant. Like it that. would. Hope yeah, so. Well, I, I hang out down there. <laughs> I've got a treat for you. Yeah. Clown news. Clown news. Yep. Clown Heck news. Yeah. Um, Heck yeah. <laughs> on what are you afraid of? Clown news. We are back with clown news on what are you afraid of? Episode one fifty six. Haunted beaches and battlefields. So this is clown news. Cue the jingle. Clown news. Love that jingle. Bill. <laughs> Bill loves that jingle. He does. Oh, yeah. So this is coming to us from the community of Annadale, Minnesota. Thank you, Barbara Duncan, by the way. Mm -hmm. A few days ago in May, there was a clown menacing the town. Wait, a clown menacing the town? Menacing the town. Yeah. Okay. Residents uh, had concerns about a clown in the area. And the sheriff's department, the police department, posted a tweet that said, Annadale residents, concerns about a clown in the area have been brought to my attention. The Annadale police is aware of this individual, and we continue to monitor the situation. In order to take any action about individuals who are potentially concerning, we need to justify a legal basis of the terms alarm or annoyance regarding the conduct someone is engaged in if an actual complaint to the police is not made. Hmm. So, so people were seeing a clown, but he wasn't doing anything. Okay. So he was just kind of... Want, what, just wandering around. Yeah, yeah, just just doing, just doing nothing. Just, just some guy in a clown clown mask. Yeah, I guess that, but that, but that's disturbing anyway, in its own right. I mean, even if he's not doing anything, just seeing a clown like standing like on a corner or something, just staring, staring around. I hate to say it, but here, yeah, yeah, I do. I could, I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could that but that's that's disturbing. A couple of the different residents talked to reporters afterwards and said they had seen a young man wearing a clown mask and was riding around the town in a scooter. He wasn't doing anything illegal. He was just bored or wanted a challenge. Okay. Katie Daniels, owner of Billy D's Crooked Tabernacle, said, It's just weird. It's not a normal thing you see around town. Uh, we've seen where this guy is standing in front of somebody's house. 
making their dog bark, and it's scaring the person, but they're not really doing anything. It's just a guy in a clown mask. Hmm. How did they know that he wasn't like a clown going to like a job, like a children's birthday party or something? You know what? Apparently, in the north, the uh, town above theirs is the home of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, where they have a clown school. Oh, okay. So, well, he know. might have been a, he might have been going to clown school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> going yeah. to clown school. So I guess we can forgive the clown. Clown college. Right? Clown college. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, nice. so, so that's Clown News on episode 156. <laughs> what are you afraid of? Thank you, Barbara Duncan. <laughs> Just when you think their sightings are over. Yep. Uh. And thanks to the internet, we have always hear about them now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> nice. This has been fun. Part of our sort of shorter shows that we're doing for the summertime as we reevaluate content and research yep. the market. It's, it's nice to be back. I hope to be doing these on a regular basis again as I sort of get my life back together. We were talking about earlier, we're doing this, this the shorter format. Yeah. With the shows. So. Yeah. But for Parax audience members, I will put on a ghost story at the end of this and some music. So don't worry, you'll have plenty of yeah. entertainment. Yeah, this will be an hour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On Power X, yeah. But we're going to end the show with a short story by an author. He wrote this in Vietnam, actually, Peter L. Holmes. I've been trying to get his story on an episode, but it's just not really fit with the content that we were doing. But since we're talking wait, about... Yeah. Wait, did he, he wrote it in Vietnam like in the, during the war or in the country? In the country. He okay, lived there. Okay, okay. Um, now, without, I, I want to say, it's, it might be like, is this like a 50-year-old story yeah. or something? Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He, he lived there. Um, he was a friend of Elka Ray's, who was on the, was okay. on the show a while back. Okay. And I, I felt so bad because I kept, I kept putting it off, and then we paused. And then there was an issue recording it. It got lost. But right. here it is, and it's a <clears> wonderful <throat> short story narrated by our good friend David Walton. It's called The Shell Seller by Peter nice. L. Holmes, and we're very glad to get it on the show, and thank you, Peter, for being so patient. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll check it out. It sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. So, it's been fun talking to you, Phil. Oh, yeah, you too, Fox. Yeah, good to be back. We'll have more as the summer goes on, and of course, we'll increase our programming as we move towards Halloween and ghosts become popular. You know what we should have done? I know we haven't uh, done a show in a while, but we mm -hmm. should have done, like, a halfway to Halloween show. We so still can. For, we still can, so, you know, it's a little... A little past it, but for, you know, for those who uh, weren't aware of it or missed it, mm -hmm. have happy halfway to Halloween. Happy I'll halfway to right Halloween. Now. Well, we can do a yeah. quarter to Halloween. You can do a quarter. Exactly. We can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds <But I'm>, good. <laughs> I'm going to get as much summer as I can first. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to rush. Anything. Yeah. No, no, no rushing Halloween. Not this year. <laughs> well, this has been episode 156, Haunted Beaches and Battlefields on What Are You Afraid of Hard Paranormal Show. Find our website at www.whatdoyouafraidofpodcast.com. And don't forget, you can hear the show on Parax Radio on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Absolutely. Okay, well, this is T. Fox Dunham. And this is Phil Thomas. Throughout time, events have occurred that have shaped human history. Spirit voices from the past have many stories to tell. And for the past several years... Channelers Barry and Connie Strom have been conducting live channeling sessions and relaying those stories and messages from those on the other side. We invite you to tune in to Barry and Connie's new show, Channeling History, on the Para-X Radio Network, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, as they relay the messages of those voices from the past, the ones who have witnessed history firsthand and those who have made history themselves. The Shell Cellar, written by Peter L. Holmes and read by David Walton. She was strong, tanned and used to the strong currents licking the seaweed which grew around the coral beds. That's where they found the best shells, lying there, waiting to be taken deep on the sandy bottom. She pushed the queen conch, bigger than her two hands, into her string bag. Its shiny, smooth edges and brilliant surface melted together into one undulating pinky-blue shape. 
She looked down and noticed the faint stream of blood between her flippers. She took off quickly for the shore, not wanting to attract unwanted company. The current was strong. She had to use all her strength to make any progress against the cross current pulling her back. As she broke the surface, the sun clouded over. Fine needles of rain struck her face and arms. As she swam through the blue-green water towards the shore, powerful strokes. Don't look back, it slows you down. There was about a hundred meters to go when a scream went out from the shore. Two tourists, a man and a younger woman, were pointing and waving frantically, shouting something in a language she didn't understand. Two large bull sharks had picked up her blood trail. Her swim pants were now heavily stained, and particles of sand stuck to the tops of her legs where the flow was heaviest. She put a spurt on, letting out a growl each time she made a downstroke, like the women playing tennis she had watched in the big hotels. The surf surged over her head, pushing her against the submerged slant of the beach. She shook off her flippers and crawled over the heavy sand beneath. The first of the sharks ran into the sand about three feet behind her, its great toothed jaws snapping and scything from side to side. The two tourists dragged her forward, leaving both sharks floundering, thrashing their tails in wild and desperate movements, like a dancing couple slipping on an over-polished ballroom floor. She fell forward, breathless. The writhing bodies and the cruel snapping jaws pulled away into the dark water, then disappeared. She thanked the couple in broken English, and the pair patted her on the back and left her to recover. She felt for the shell, closing her eyes in relief as its smoothness kissed her thigh. A dangerous game, but what else could she do? Her home was built of bamboo and rough brick, lying about 200 metres from the shore. She went in and put the shell down on a mat on the floor, in the centre of the one large room. Terracotta tiles and straw lined the roof, holding the cool breeze. She let out a sigh as she showered, changed her clothes, cursing she was not a man. Her long black hair dripped onto the mat as she sat down, cross-legged, and picked up the shell. A tiny crab scuttled out which made her start, then laugh, as she watched it scoot along the dirt floor and into a shadow, its claws held up in defiance. She had lived in the house for two years with Tran, her husband, a local man. He was tall, tanned, and bearded, about fifty he always said, though he looked younger. Tattoos, now faded, graced his back and arms, telling stories of tales of lost kingdoms and fierce dragons with tongues of fire. Here's your breakfast, come and eat, she called to her sleeping daughter. She stirred and moved the sheets a little as she turned to face her. Mum, I love you, she said smiling as the sun threw a weave of dappled light over her bed. She took her and hugged her, then kissed her on the cheek. They ate the noodles and beef she had prepared, then Toomey set off for school on her bike. Tall palms waved her on, and the village dogs gave her a barking send-off as she sped along the dusty road, with fellow school-aged travellers shouting and laughing, all going in the same direction. She took a wooden box crammed with shells from underneath Toomey's bed, selected the best six and put them in a shoulder bag and set off to Anbang Tourist Beach. The sun was rising and it was hot. A few tourists were already lounging on the beach in the distance. Small fishing boats tilted to one side after a night's fishing, hosted sandflies and sparrows. Coloured floats and fishing nets lay draped like skirts drying over their sides, ready to be used again that same night. She knew she could make money if she slept with the foreigners, 
Some of the local women had made that sacrifice to feed their families, but they looked old before their time. She stood out in her cut-off jeans and bright red blouse. Her long black hair swept over her shoulders as she walked, kicking sand in front of her as she went. The roar and rush of the breakers was ever-present, and she tried to imagine what it would be like without their sound. Quiet and scandalous, she mused, smiling as the thought pirouetted through her mind. She sold all the shells, including the big one. One hundred American dollars were stuffed into the pockets of her shorts, enough to feed her and Toomey for the rest of the month. She took a shortcut through the trees, standing back from the beach. The sea danced, tall palms swayed and bowed to each other, occasionally dropping a coconut or two. The sand underfoot was cool in the shadows. Fallen palm fronds cracked underneath her feet as she hummed a tune into the cool breeze. A shiny red mass caught her eye among the marrow grass a few feet ahead. She froze. Staring in disbelief, she edged closer to the object, bloody, glistening, and alive with ants. Oh my god! Oh my god! she whispered, bringing her hands to her mouth. She bent over, feeling a wave of nausea. A large cashew nut would, she guessed, have been its size. The barely discernible features, neither boy nor girl, monster nor fair. Who were you, sweet unborn child? The blood caked around its form could not hide the minuscule budding hands, the tiny fingers reaching out. Shh, little one, keep your sleep, go to heaven, she whispered, looking around to see if she was alone with the fetus. What should she do? How could she make this right? Throwing back her hair, she leaned forward and picked up a banana tree leaf. She scooped up the fetus and walked through the heat to the water's edge, washing the little body clean of sand and ants. She turned back from where she had come. A whimper, then a wail came from the patch of trees where she had found the fetus. Then it was gone. The ground was easy to dig, and in a few minutes the little grave was deep enough to cover the green banana leaf coffin, tied with marram grass. She placed it carefully at the bottom of the grave and said a prayer. Her words floated around the trees and echoed back again, like sound shadows, from the leaves and rustling fronds. Then the wail she had heard before at the water's edge repeated, then vanished. She looked back over to the patch of ground among the trees, then turned to the sea, feeling a presence envelop her, warm, soothing. She put it down to the shock of her find and the waft of wind through the trees. Years later, she never forgot that day, what she'd found and did. Her daughter had grown, married and left home. Tran, her husband, cared for her and loved her, she loved him in return with the passion of a Vietnamese woman. She'd been gone an hour, on a forage for shells in the lagoon. Tran had heard unfamiliar sounds. Moans, sighs, crying. A spiky leaden hand grabbed his beating heart, and he crashed through the house scattering books and empty cups, and sprinted to the beach as the sounds grew louder, more insistent. To the beach. He must get there, and ran like a mad dog to the edge of the sea. My love, where are you? But the sea answered back with a hush and a breeze. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. He screamed her name and dived into the waves towards the shell reef, swimming like a madman the waves urging him forward, shouting in his ears, Down, go down, she's there, she's there. And down he went, and there she lay, face down, her hair wafting in the troubled water, arms outspread in the warm sea, 
He took hold of her limp body and kicked his feet, blowing into her mouth as they broke the surface, and dragged her back to the shore. He swept the weed-covered hair from her face and wept, holding her tight in his arms. Then he heard a sound which made him shudder. A sigh, a child's voice, neither happy nor sad, coming from the patch of trees behind them. He looked, but nothing was there, only the waft of the trees and the swish and play of the wind-blown waves, as they washed the blood from her thighs. Or do you want to go spend your afterlife at the beach? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, I'm back and forth. T. Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife, Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books. A television series based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the Tangible Illusion of Reality or Searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox's story in the Stargate Anthology Points of Origin from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Fox is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and he's had published hundreds of short stories and articles. His motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. Find out more information at www.tfoxdunham.com. Phil Thomas is an author and screenwriter from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His screenplays have been produced into two feature films, False Face and Always From Darkness, and are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon Prime On Demand. His screenplay, Three Tunnels, was a semi-finalist at the LA Screenplay Competition. He is a member of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors, and he currently writes for Cultured Vultures. Game Skinny and BloodyDisgusting.com. He formerly held the position of Senior Marketing Manager at Eternal Press and was a journalist for Patch where he wrote a daily tech column covering the latest electronics and gadgets. He lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is currently working on his second novel, Worst Afterlife Ever. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.